welcome to our flipped classroom. Welcome to the first lesson that we're going to have on ancient world history. We're going to go from the beginning of recorded history, the beginning of empires, the beginning of civilizations, all the way through exploration of the Western Hemisphere. And we're going to start off looking at the advancement of the world, the advancement of civilization, of technology, of language, of trade. And we're going to start looking at these ancient river civilizations. And you can see on this map here, we're going to be centering around India, China, and the Middle East. And the first civilizations we're going to be looking at take place in that orange section that you can see in the background. And that is the area of Mesopotamia. So let's get started. Now, in every PowerPoint you're going to see, we're going to have some questions, some essential questions, the things that we are really going to focus on learning through this PowerPoint. And the essential questions for this PowerPoint are, why does civilization arise? How does it endure? And what factors are necessary for it to really advance and flourish? So let's take a look at answering those questions while looking at Mesopotamia. Now, Mesopotamia is a section of the Middle East around the Tigris and Euphrates River and also along the border of the Mediterranean Sea. And what you're looking at right now is referred to commonly as the Fertile Crescent because thousands of years ago this was a plentiful area for food, particularly wheat and barley. And one thing that's very important that we're going to learn about civilization is for civilization to arise, you have to have a great food source. That could be corn or yams or wheat or barley or rice. And if you don't have a very strong food source that can give you a lot of energy and protein, civilizations will endure because they don't have the proper food sources. So, in the Fertile Crescent, we have the Sumerians. Now, the Fertile Crescent itself is very, very flat. And it doesn't have natural resources in the way of building materials. And we're going to find out what the people of Mesopotamia did to grow their civilization and overcome that. The civilizations of Mesopotamia are going to be around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And the reason why we're going to see these civilizations arise, especially around these river areas, is because of silt. I cannot emphasize enough how important this silt is. This is new soil that is deposited along riverbanks that's really good for farming. Now, when civilizations learn to control this, because the Tigris and Euphrates were very unpredictable with flooding and depositing this new silt. And so it's very difficult to farm until you can use irrigation. And again, irrigation is basically digging ditches and trenches that lead water away from a stream or a river and into farming territory. And this is going to control that flooding. This is going to allow regular crops to be grown. Specifically in Mesopotamia, it is wheat and barley. But this is also going to do something very important. Because before this, people were constantly moving. They were nomadic. They were hunting. They were gathering. But they were never staying in one place. Now that you have people that are growing food, in one spot, they're now going to be tied to this land. So they now are going to build permanent dwellings. They are now going to become farmers more so than hunters, nomadic people who follow groups of animals. Now, here's some disadvantages to the Fertile Crescent and the solutions that the people of Mesopotamia had. Now, again, we talked about unpredictable farming. So you create irrigation. And you can see in the bottom right hand picture, irrigation that the Mesopotamians had used. You can see the river or body of water off to the top left of that picture. And you can see that they dig these trenches that will take it to different areas for farming. Another disadvantage to the Fertile Crescent is there are not natural barriers. For a civilization to really arise, you need some sort of barrier to stop other peoples from coming in and wiping you out. A lot of times that could be oceans or deserts or mountains. So what the people of Mesopotamia did is they built walls, large walls with mud bricks to make man-made barriers from possible invaders. The third disadvantage is their natural resources were limited and that is in building materials, things like stone, wood, 
metals, things to construct civilization. But the one thing they did have a lot of was food, grain. They had a lot of cloth. In fact, most of the animals that are domesticated that we eat today come from Mesopotamia. Sheep, goats, cows, and horses all originate in Mesopotamia. And they traded these goods for those building materials that they needed. Now, when we're talking about civilizations, the Sumerians and the Fertile Crescent are really the first civilization that arises that we can date back in history. And there are five reasons why they are the first civilizations. And we're going to expand on these in this PowerPoint. But the five are advanced cities, specialized workers, complex institutions, record keeping, and improved technology. And we're going to be talking about these in depth right now. Again, the first thing are advanced cities and complex institutions. So what you're going to have in these in the Sumerian area is you're going to have city-states. City-states are a political unit where you have a major city that's surrounded by farms. It doesn't have a whole lot of territory, but it's a, it's a country, it's a nation of its own that is centered around the city and the farming land around it. You can see on the map on the right what some of these city-states were, like Uruk, Kish, Lagash, Uma, and Ur. In fact, Ur was one of the largest of these early civilization cities. Now, these cities are going to be controlled by temple priests because religion is going to be seen as very important to this, this civilization. However, when there was a war situation, when you have invaders that are coming against that nation state, the city would choose a warrior to command the city. Now, this is when things get interesting. Because again, this is early history, the first time we see civilizations. And this trend that we're about to see happens often, even today, where a warrior, a general, a military leader takes control of a city, state, or a nation, and then does not step down and, so, and will become the full leader of that nation or nation state. Now, in, in Mesopotamia, we would have these leaders that are going to pass on power to their sons. They're going to pass on their responsibilities and their leadership throughout their family because, obviously, if you're the leader of a nation, say you're going to be rich, you're going to have things that you want, and obviously you're going to want to have that continue for your family. This is going to create something called a dynasty, which is a series of rulers from one family. We're going to see when we look at China, dynasties that would last for hundreds and hundreds of years, where people from the same family continue to rule. Another reason why we have advanced civilizations in Mesopotamia is because of specialized workers, where not everyone is a farmer, not everyone is a hunter, where people have time to develop specific skills, such as cloth weaving, metalworking, selling goods, creating goods. And when you have time to master those crafts, you have specialization. Now, not only does that is that based off of craftsmanship, but it also applies to political leadership. Kings, people who know how to speak, how to lead, how to command economies and, and social groups, landowners, how to distribute land, how to get rent, how to grow things. Priests, people who are religious specialists, who don't spend any time farming, but instead take care of the religious responsibilities of that civilization. And even slaves, people who are taken from other city-states or kingdoms and brought back to be a labor class. The, this division of political and economic specialization is a marker of an advanced civilization because people have time to become masters at something. Another thing is record keeping. The Mesopotamians have the earliest known form of writing that we have been able to find, and it's called cuneiform. They're written on stone tablets, and the earliest one that we have, the earliest one that we can find, is from 2300 BCE. Now, the interesting thing is what we found on these cuneiform tablets. Believe it or not, these people who were writing down this information 
weren't just talking about life and writing journals and daily lives. They were talking about astronomy, looking at the stars. They were talking about chemistry. They were looking at medicine. And they were recording these things to pass on that information to others. And that's a great marker of civilization for people to, again, not only master concepts and crafts, but to also pass on that knowledge to the next generation. Because if you do not, if you do not educate yourself, then you're not going to be as successful as a civilization because the specialized masters will eventually go and die. And that knowledge needs to be passed on, and not just passed on, but built upon. And that's what we're seeing here in Mesopotamia. Also, we're going to see the advancement of technology. We're going to see in Mesopotamia the very beginning origins of arithmetic, math, and geometry. We're going to see the invention of different architectural styles like arches, columns, ramps, and even the basis of the pyramid. We call them uh, ziggurats in Mesopotamia. The ziggurat is, an, is a very advanced form of technology because these would be, be, be 30, 40, 50 meters high. So you're going to need to create special materials to build that. You're going to need to create things like ramps to get those materials to be built. And, and it's interesting that these large structures, which would take years to build, and countless men and slaves to build these, were a religious symbol where gods would be worshipped. Now what does that tell us? That tells us that religion is important to these civilizations. Now at this time, the Mesopotamians were polytheistic, which means they did not believe in one main god, but they believed in many gods who would have different responsibilities. For, uh, for example, Enlil, Enlil, who we see on the picture on the right here, is the god of storms and air. Now you're probably wondering, why would he be the most powerful god for Mesopotamia? Think about this. If your entire civilization relies on the food that you can grow. Wouldn't rain, wouldn't the weather be the most important factor to you? And so when that is, and if you're creating these gods, who would you make the most powerful god? The one that controls your food source. The one that really controls life or death in these civilizations. And that's why Enlil is the most important and powerful god for Mesopotamia. Now, let's talk about some of these empires in particular that we're seeing in Mesopotamia. Now, an empire, and you need to know this, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to disregard your intelligence, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. An empire is when you have several people. It's not just one nation state or one, one kingdom, but several of them together under the control of one ruler. And that can happen peacefully. That could happen in, in a war situation as well. And what we see is the, the first kingdom in Mesopotamia is Akkad. And we find this in 2350 BCE, before Common Era. The founder of this kingdom is going to be Sargon. Now we can see a picture of Sargon and a, and a bust of his face on the picture on the right. And he's going to unite in all the city-states of, of Sumer, all the city-states of that fertile crescent region around the Tigris and Euphrates rhythm, not by diplomatic means and negotiation, but by war, by conquering. What we then see, about 350 years later, is the beginnings of something called the Babylonian Empire. Now, the Babylonian, Babylonian Empire came about, their, very, their origins, and we're going to see this in a lot of of different civilizations that take power is that their civilization is based on war. The reason why is they are nomadic. They are constantly hunting. They are constantly tracking. And when you live in a lifestyle like that, you naturally become a good warrior. And the origins of the Babylonian Empire were the Amorites, these nomadic warriors who constantly moved around. They were not um, farmers. They did not create permanent dwellings. Now, as the Babylonian Empire was at its peak, the ruler for the Babylonians was named Hammurabi. He's going to rule from 1792 to 1750 BCE. And he creates something very interesting. In fact, the very basis for law and rules within civilization. And it's called Hammurabi's Code. And it's going to be a uniform code of laws. 
that everyone has to obey. Now, why would you even create laws? The answer would be to create order and unity. You need everyone to understand how they need to act and behave in a society for people to be safe and for the rulers to have control over the people. Now, it's interesting that he did not, that he wrote this down on stone and put these large stone obelisks, which we're going to see on the next slide, all over his empire so everyone could see them and read them and know them. Now, you can see one of these obelisks on the picture on the right here. The picture below the notes itself is actually Hammurabi dictating these laws. And there are going to be 282 laws. Yes, I know that would be a lot to memorize. But 282 laws Hammurabi creates. Now, this covers a wide variety of aspects within Mesopotamian and Sumerian civilization. This uh, affects family relations, how you conduct business, criminal activities. And the interesting thing is that this, these laws actually protected women and protected the treatment that others would have for them. And this is really showing us something interesting. This is showing us that to the Mesopotamians, they believed in rules and orders, not only in business, not only in crime, but in family, and particularly prote protecting women as well. Now take a look at an example of some of these Hammurabi's law. And I want you to look at 196. 196 is a very interesting law because we've heard this all the time. Have you ever heard the phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Whatever you do to someone will be done to you. Hammurabi's code is the basis for that. And every law system that's created afterwards, no matter where it is, no matter when it's created, all of them can be traced back. The origins of law and order can be found in Hammurabi's code. Well, that's it for lesson number one. I hope you enjoyed learning about Mesopotamia. Thanks for watching.